Hi, I'm Jeff Farnwald, director of the MBA program at Rockford University. About 18 months ago, the Rockford Chamber of Commerce set out to make networking easier in Rockford by identifying area people you should know in business. Currently, 41 people have been recognized and celebrated as one of these people. This series of talks held at Rockford University was designed to provide a vehicle for the public to hear from and learn about each of the people you should know. I hope you enjoy this talk. Started, thank you so much for coming on this beautiful day today. Um, if you would turn off your electronic devices, that would be great. And I will introduce Dr. Head. Robert L. Head, PhD, came to Rockford University in June 2008 as its 17th president. He was previously president of Urbana University in Ohio and a vice president at Benedictine University in Illinois. Dr. Head has an impressive background, which includes many years of experience in the banking industry. He served as vice president for trust services in Toledo at Toledo Trust Company in Ohio and vice president for trust services at Northern Trust Company in Chicago during the 80s and 90s. His impact on Rockford University has been remarkable. Highlights include the successful transition from Rockford College to Rockford University on July 1, 2013 steadily increasing enrollments that hit 20-year highs for fall 2014 and maintaining strong financial discipline resulting in eight consecutive years of positive net income. Dr. Head is on the boards of Swedish American Health Systems, Rockford Chamber of Commerce, the Golden Apple Foundation, the Rockford Rotary Club, Alignment Rockford, Kobe College Corporation, the Federation of Independent Illinois Colleges and University, and the Associated Colleges of Illinois. He also serves as Scoutmaster for Boy Scout Troop 9 and is a member of the Steering Committee for Transform Rockford. Dr. Head is also the 20, one of the 2012 people you should know. Dr. Head and his wife, Cheryl, had three adult children. I don't know how you have time to sleep. <laughs> Please welcome Dr. Robert Head. Thank you, thank you. And good afternoon, everybody. You know, I had the privilege of speaking uh, within this uh, forum, forum a couple of years ago, right before we did change our name. And at that time, I, um, let's see if I can turn this on. There we go. It's fine. There we go. I had the privilege of talking about what was uh, happening within higher education as an industry. And uh, as I was um, bribed into service for this presentation, <laughs> if anyone's here to see Sarah, she's not here. It's me. Uh, <laughs> I talked more about Rockford University, our present situation, and, and, and kind of where we're headed. Um, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine. I'm about to start my eighth year here at the university, and it's been a, been a pleasure working with my colleagues to uh, assist our students in their learning journey. I want to thank the, uh, the chamber for its efforts in many, many ways to recognize people within our community who have an impact on our community in a positive way, and thank my colleagues here at the university for uh, spearheading this ongoing uh, series of presentations that really challenges us to think about what we can do better as, an, uh, as, a, as, a, as a community. Uh, so before talking about some of the positive things that are happening with in Rockford University, let me just share a few of the things that occasionally keep me up at night, <laughs> which will give you a frame of reference for what we're going to be doing in the future. Like most of your industries, higher education is somewhat in, in flux. So I'm going to talk about five different things, if I can. And the first one is what's happened over the course of the last three decades particularly that really have changed things between public universities and private universities. Uh, like many of you, potentially, um, no, nobody's here as old as I am, so that's okay. Not like you. <laughs> but back when I was searching for uh, a college or a university to attend, um, there was absolutely no doubt, I grew up in the state of Ohio, no doubt that I uh, would not go to The Ohio State University. Open enrollment, 40 or 50,000 people. They would take anybody. 
I want to be educated at a private liberal arts school, much more exclusive, much better reputation for academics. In those days, the publics were the source of accessibility. The privates were basically more aligned with higher standards for students. Some of that's changed because most of the land based um, land grant public institutions around the country, almost all of them, are now extremely exclusive. It is tough to get into Ohio State without a 27 ACT or higher, unless you're a football player. It's tough to get into the University of Illinois. So as I've shared many, many times, within the state of Illinois, there are more citizens from this state who attend private schools than public schools. There are more minority students from this state who attend private schools than public schools. And there are more students from families with incomes below 15,000 that attend private schools than public schools. We give $8 million as an institution in financial aid. That really helps families be able to afford this education. We have an average ACT score between 22 and 23, <clears throat> not the 26 that the University of Illinois might require. So we have become, in total, within Illinois, the private institutions, we have become the option for accessibility in many regards. Lots of debate. You'll read about it probably once every month or so at least that is a liberal arts education the way to go. Some believe that we are like the dinosaurs and should just fade away. I disagree with that. And let me tell you why, because first of all, I don't think most people who are writing about liberal arts education have any idea what it means. None whatsoever. Cliff Notes version. Liberal is not a political persuasion. <laughs> it's not a way of thinking. It's about what we as citizens do to be active and engaged in a free society, liberal, free society. Arts equals skills. So what are the skills necessary for an educated person to be productive in a free society? Skills like communication, speaking, writing, skills like being analytical, being creative, those are the kinds of things that we help teach our students. Those are the kinds of things that I know that employers want. This uh, is about to be my 15th year as a university president. I have yet to meet a student who doesn't want a career. So this talk about not going to liberal arts school because it's unproductive, I think is really not very, very valid. Demographic concerns, and Eric Folkemer's here. He's our Vice President for Enrollment Management. I love, I love those wonderful things said about me in my bio, but really those things are the result of the 220 full-time people that work here at the university and all of our part-timers and adjuncts as well. I give Eric great credit for our changes in enrollment. It's particularly given the way that we are challenged by demographics, birth rates, in the Midwest are going down. The number of high school graduates in Illinois, in, in, in the Midwest in total are going down. That's been a trend since 2008. It's been a trend in Illinois since 2011. If you wanted to open up a university or college today, the last place you'd want to be is in the Midwest because of those things. Um, and the projections over the course of the next 15 years are a continued decline. So we are competing in an environment with fewer students who are wanting to go to college, and in some cases, even more competitors. RBC and NIU have trends of declining enrollments. We have a trend of an increasing enrollment. That's a good thing for us, a bad thing for RBC. And in some cases, I would tell you it's a bad thing for Rockford University that RBC is declining. We get more than 200 transfer students a year, with at least half of them coming from RBC. We want them to be healthy. We want them to grow. That too will help us. 
the last time I was here, there was this big scare in higher education that these massive open online courses were going to take over the world. Uh, courses that could accommodate hundreds and not thousands of students, taught by renowned faculty from around the world, and offered for no charge. Subsequent research has demonstrated that most of the students who sign up for these massive online courses, MOOCs, don't finish the courses. Most of those who sign up for MOOCs also already have a baccalaureate degree. They're wanting to learn something or be updated on something specifically. A little bit of, um, in my mind, uh, kind of a vacation from this kind of a thinking. I think MOOCs is going to be something that we're going to have to face down the road at some point in time. And what's the key to doing that? At this point in time, no one has figured out what the model is for monetizing it. When that happens, MOOCs will be back, I'm sure. Um, and the last thing I'll tell you about me in the environment is this thing called competition that you're all very, very familiar with. Uh, we are still viewed around the world, we, American higher education, still viewed around the world as being the best in the world. The percentages of students from other countries who are coming to the United States in total is declining. Percentages are increasing for countries like Canada, England, and Australia. So there is going to be more competition worldwide. When I look at um, something you might have seen about a month ago, the Department of Education released its watch list for financial responsibility. There are 500 or more institutions on that watch list. A significant change. Over 200 of them were for-profit institutions. Two years ago when I was talking, I was concerned about where the for-profits were headed. But now the track record is there that most of them are not as successful with students as the rest of us. Most of them have found themselves having significant declines in enrollment. There have been 25 institutions like Rockford University around the country that have closed in the last eight years. The last major announcement was Sweetbriar, which is a women's only institution. Sweetbriar has an endowment of $100 million, but yet they have not found the magic uh, formula for recruiting students, and their enrollment is also declining. There are two bills that are pending in Illinois that could change our environment. One is a bill that will allow four-year publics to partner with community colleges. So NIU could partner with Rock Valley. Rock Valley would offer the courses for a baccalaureate degree on their campus. NIU would offer all of their programs at Rock Valley for baccalaureate and doctoral and, and graduate degrees. The other bill will just straight out give community colleges the opportunity to offer baccalaureate degrees. Well, this is really nothing new around the country. There are 20 or more states that allow that today. It would be something new in our state, and my projection is it's going to happen in the next few years. So what is it that we must do um, to be competitive going forward, particularly about environment changes in that direction? Imagine going to Rock Valley, whose tuition is $3,200 a year times four, $12,000 baccalaureate degree, which is half of one year here at Rockford University. Again, we give a lot of financial aid, but that's our sticker price, so it's half of one year. I don't think much is going to change within our industry in terms of how it's tiered. People are going to find the Ivy League schools to be of value for them given their prestige and history. People are going to find community colleges to be a cost-effective way of being educated. And the rest of us are going to be fighting for our market share. And the way that we're going to fight for our market share is to make a four-year residential experience of value to students and their families. Probably not going to be able to read this, but each year we do, we participate in a survey. It's called the National Survey for Student Engagement. 
There are 12 criteria. Our students filled this out, as well as students from more than 1,000 different institutions around the country. The wonderful thing is that, if you'll just notice the purple bars, they're higher than all the white bars, which means that our students rate their experience in all 10 of the criteria higher than the students of our peer institutions. The shaded areas, and there are five, for those of you who are math related, um, means that those ones are uh, statistically significant. Big gaps, big pluses for our students in their view of Rockford University. It kind of says that what we say we're gonna do, we do, and they appreciate that, and that's a good thing. We're good today. In the environment that I've talked about that's changing, we're gonna have to be even better tomorrow. So that's our focus. Um, we've come a long way since 2006. A long way, and I've gotta, again, thank my, my colleagues and the faculty, staff, our alumni, our students, for making those kinds of things happen. You heard from Michelle about our enrollment numbers, 20 year high, it's a wonderful thing up 9% in the fall of 14 from the fall of 13, up 27% since 2006. Uh, we have students from 29 states and 22 countries, adding greatly to the diversity of our community, and that's a really good thing. We're expecting an increase in enrollment for this coming fall as well. I keep looking at this guy, I wanna make sure of that. Um, but it's gonna put us into a new dialogue over the summer. We uh, are doing some interesting things just to make sure that we have spaces, residential spaces for students for this fall. So we're gonna be in dialogue about what comes next, which could be as early as the fall of 16 and not the fall of 17, in terms of housing, whether it be apartment style housing or something, acquiring an apartment building in the area, all those things will be on the table and be discussed. It's a good problem to have. So during this course of the last several years, even a part of it being during this global economic recession, we've been able to do some wonderful things financially. We've had eight years in a row of positive net income. That's a really good thing. Our assets have increased substantially, our, de our liabilities have decreased substantially as well. So we have a pretty good foundation. Even in the midst of this, we've been able to uh, invest uh, $15 million or more in some capital improvements. And I'll just walk you through a few of those. A lot of them are in this building. Technology, we have now, invested in 41 classrooms with this kind of smart technology. 4,000 feet of fiber optics have been laid. Several new computer uh, classrooms have been created. A Couple of my all-time favorites. Uh, you probably don't even recognize what this is. It's a chiller. Air conditions are major buildings on campus. Seems to be a, not much of a thing, otherwise I'll tell you it's a million dollars in cost, so uh, we got that one accomplished. We also are able to renovate over a period of three or four summers all of our residence halls, the last one being last year, about 1.2 million. That's a good thing. Uh, things I think I probably got the most applause for was back in 2011, when we actually resurfaced about three miles of our roads and parking lots on campus. Again, it was only money, another million dollars, but we had some great donors who really supported our initiatives and efforts going forward. And probably the crown jewel, uh, from my perspective, is that we were able to acquire this building, the old Whitehead building, which serves as a modern classroom teaching facility for our business program. And as you know, last fall, we recognized the donor of this building, Sunil Puri, an alumnus and trustee, by naming our business program the Puri Business School. So if you're looking at the slide and wondering where the Puri Business School sign might be, it's not there yet. This is the graphic that we're waiting to get approved to, to move forward with it. Um, this past summer, we took on a couple of other major renovations. If you have not been to the Burpee Center to see our new student space, you need to go. It's uh, just a wonderful, wonderful facility. And the students are enjoying it, uh, enjoying it greatly. And then the Seaver building, this is actually the architect's rendering, not the exact picture of how it looks, but pretty darn close. Seaver was a 47,000 square foot facility, a few classrooms, our gymnasium. 
built in the 1960s. Now, unfortunate thing about it is that it was built before Title IX. So I'm not sure how many athletic teams that we have now. 15. So it was built at a time when we probably had half of that. It meant that all of our athletic teams would practice in one gymnasium. And we'd also try to do intramurals. So sometimes our intramurals were scheduled for like 11.30 at night. I remember that one specifically. So we've taken out the swimming pool, which none of our students used, and constructed a second gym. This is the first phase of a longer term project that you'll hear more about later in the fall. I, I, I mentioned uh, many, many times how proud I am to be a part of this 168 year legacy that Rockford University has. Um, and, and working with my colleagues. But let me tell you, one of the big things that I think we do really well is that we try to enhance the cultural, social, and economic fabric of our community. You know, we still have as our major focus creating a more educated citizenry. But we have things like NICNI the Northern Illinois Center for Nonprofit Excellence, which helps social service agencies, for the most part, become better. The Jane Addams Center for Civic Engagement, a part of our community, which seeks to coordinate and channel more than 1,800 student service hours, volunteer hours, to their advantage. Uh, Jeff leads a program, our Leadership Institute, which seeks to help corporations become better in their leadership. And we also provide the school district some $2 million in scholarships and financial aid for its graduates. Again, attempt to uplift our community. Interestingly enough, we announced a, almost two years ago that we would provide a free education within our business program for anyone who was unemployed for 18 or more months. I think we've only had a couple of people take us up on that, but it's an offer that exists today. Um, in addition to those things that I've talked about, which are a part of Rockford University, we also offer space to a couple organizations that we're quite proud of. The Golden Apple Foundation being one, and Artist Ensemble Theater being another. Artist Ensemble Theater, professional theater group, that also provides opportunities for our performing arts students to do internships with and to act in. Um, you might have seen a year or so ago, a year and a half ago, the release of our economic impact study, which was done by a third party organization. A summary of that is that Rockford University, in the communities that we serve, provides an economic impact of 118.1 million. That's a good number. That's a nice number to throw out. But I think what's more important for me to tell you is that our impact is far beyond that. I'm going to guess that probably 20 to 25 percent of the teachers in this region are our graduates. When you look at the names on many of the buildings, the companies represented are led by Rockford University graduates. So you have companies like Midwest Errol, Entree Computer, Woodward, William Charles, the Rockford Park District, First Rockford Group, Four City Gear, OSF St. Anthony Hospital, Rock Valley College, Savant Capital Management. Those are all businesses which are led by a Rockford University graduate. And I'm really proud of that. I think the number is two out of the last seven years. The Teacher of the Year in the State of Illinois has been a Rockford University graduate. Last year's Teacher of the Year in North Carolina was a Rockford University graduate. Two years ago, the Teacher of the Year in Wisconsin was a Rockford University graduate. So lots and lots of good things are going on in that regard. Let me jump to um, the future. I can't believe that um, in only 18 days we're going to hold commencement. And these graduates will join the ranks of 15,000 Rockford University graduates around the world. And that's a pretty important thing. Um, as I see it, the successes that we've had can be connected to the continuing great teaching that goes on on our campus, could be connected to some new policies and processes and enrollment, 
name change, facilities improvement, but whatever the situation is, I think we're on the right path to be successful for generations to come in a very, very challenging area. Let me finish up by just sharing some new programs that we have, and I'll open up to questions. Uh, Journal of Psychology is a new program. I mention that because it's the first program that we have that will be delivered fully in an online fashion. Not a big fan of online. I am a big fan of Rockford University. 50% of students today are taking at least one online course. That might be the wave of the future, and I want to make sure this university is prepared to enter that. So we do have our first fully online program up and running. Business department has started a minor in entrepreneurship probably two years ago. Open to all of our students who might find that of value. Next year we start a new major in dance. And we're still brainstorming a couple of other programs. One would be um, software engineering. Another might be supply chain management. Those are just in the idea phase at this point in time. So let me just stop there and ask if there are any questions I can answer for you.